is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Rome, Season 1, Episode 2, How Titus Pullo Brought Down the Republic. In this episode, I don't really want to like Titus, but I can't help but like Titus. Like, he's just like, you know, that kind of dude. Makes me a little uncomfortable, but people are complicated, I guess. Also, I get that reunion that I was waiting for, and spoiler alert, it doesn't go awesome. Yeah, a lot of stuff doesn't go awesome. There's a lot to talk about. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Huge thanks to Sean for commissioning the second episode. And Sean is in the chat here. Hello, Sean. Um, so, guys, this episode, though, it is, a, a, I feel like, a really good sign how invested in this all I am, despite not always knowing enough about the history of things or the way that politics are conducted here um, to be able to make good predictions about how something is going to blow up in someone's face or go a certain way or what have you. Um, but I really like, so, so the first thing I want to address is when I said that I don't really want to like Polo, I, what I mean is we know he's a rapist. Like that was specifically addressed and talked about at the beginning of this first episode. And it's the kind of thing, there is a similar thing that goes on in another show um, that I, I, I'm not going to spoil and say what show or what character or anything, but there's another show that I really like that has a character whom in the very first episode rapes a woman you don't really see it it's kind of like a implied thing but it happened like there's no mistaking what they intend you to think and yet you really like the dude as a character and it feels like as the show continues they kind of want you to forget about that like they they I feel like the show wanted to go one way with this dude's character, realized that they didn't enjoy making him kind of a bad guy or even like a morally gray guy, and instead wanted to make him be like, you know, some some other measure of like maybe just politically in experienced or foolish or just not a good judge of human nature, but they didn't want to make him be that dude that it seemed like they were setting up initially and they really, really pulled back and wound up going in a direction that I think really points to, they want us to pretend that first episode and what happened in that first episode never happened. And as a woman, it's a really tough thing because violence against women is something that is used so often in media that to have them use it and then try and pretend that it never happened is a tough pill to swallow. It's supposed to be, you know, this magical character development for women characters a lot of the time. Um, and yet when the script decides like, oh, but we want you to like this guy, we're just going to ignore it and pretend it didn't happen. I obviously have only watched two episodes of the show so I don't have a good grasp on whether or not they're going to pull that sort of thing with this character also. But I feel like this show is going in a different direction than the one I was previously talking about. Because what they do on this show is they seem to just show you, here is how it is. This is how things were handled. This was the attitude of the day. This is the way this class of people were treated. And 
they don't really seem that worried about how you like that character or not. They don't really seem to be concerned. And again, that may change. I may start to get a sense that they really are struggling with how they want an audience to perceive a thing. But as of right now, in setting all of this up, it really feels like they want us to see everybody in this culture, in this period, was brutal in their own way. You know, we have, yes, he raped women. There's also this noble born woman who is ripping her daughter away from a husband that she literally married and loves in order to just sell her to some dude for political gain. We also have, you know, so like there's just a lot of different types of ruthlessness and brutality. So it sort of just comes down to what are you willing to stomach in order to say that you like a character? Do you want to be able to say that you like any of these characters? Is that the point? I don't think so. Um, but again, we shall see. At this moment, I'm just really surprised at how baldly they are. Uh, they're willing to portray even characters that I think we are meant to think are good people initially, you know? So I kind of respect that. And it's a very tricky thing to do because there's not, it, it's especially doing what I do. It's not easy to watch things and not assign judgment to them because they're being, it, it's not like we're actually watching a snapshot of the past. We're watching a created moment by writers who are deciding what they would like to put on a screen for viewers. Like this is obviously curated, invented and fictional. So there, there is some judgment to that, but I really, and I have, I don't have a ton of knowledge about the Roman era, but there are some things that I do know about. Horrible histories, anyone? I was a big fan. And there are some things in this that got my attention because I remember them being talked about like that and how accurate they are. So I'm going to back up now and start from the beginning. But I just kind of wanted to address that because Titus is not really a good person by our standards now and he clearly isn't considered a good person by plenty of people and yet there is something likable about him and it's just you know that's how it is though people talk about well my friend could never have raped or assaulted anybody he's a good guy people are complicated somebody can be a great guy a lot of the time and then go home and beat his wife Somebody can be incredibly reliable to his friends and be a complete monster to folks in his family. Like, that's just how humans are. And I always just find it so amusing when people make these, like, broad brush claims that so-and-so is not capable of a thing because I know him from church. Like, you don't know him. And it's just... I mean, I firmly believe that a lot of us don't know what we ourselves are capable of and who knows us better than us. So don't be surprised when somebody that you thought you knew turns out to be, you know, behaving in a way that you thought was wildly out of character. You can you can predict generally how you think somebody's going to react, but unless you are living with a person, you don't really know. Um, so, all right, let's back up here. Let's start at the beginning of, of the episode, which is taking place in Gaul. It says near the Italian border winter. Um, and I love it because like all of these people, it's obviously Gaul near the Italian border winter. Everybody's walking around in short sleeves and everything, but this dude is coming in and talking to Caesar and being like, everybody's really sick of this cold and, and wet. And I'm just like, mm, y'all need to toughen up a little, buddy. That's all I'm saying. Um, and he is reporting to Caesar that a lot of the soldiers are, what do you call it? Are deserting. Um, and Caesar is feeling... 
a little bit resentful of this dude because this guy is incredibly presumptuous, I feel like, in how he talks to Caesar. He's really certain because he says something about how these guys aren't happy here because of the way that, you know, we're just sitting doing nothing. They definitely aren't going to march on Rome with you either. And he's trying to get him to see these desertions are a pattern that is going to start to, you know, increase probably exponentially as time goes on. And you can keep dismissing them as being weak and cowardly and selfish. But guess what? People are weak and cowardly and selfish and you still need them. So he's like get kind of getting in, in Caesar's face here a little bit. Um, and Caesar is... What's the word I want? He is crafty. That's the word I want. He is looking at this dude and understands the the reservations that this guy has. But he also has a whole plan up his sleeve that this dude does not know about. This guy is called Posca, by the way. And I, I am going to try and remember that like Tosca, the uh, opera. He says something really snide at first. I would not expect a slave to understand the subtleties. Um, I trust an education in these subtleties will begin shortly. And he says this again in this way. And Caesar looks at him like, dude, you really need to back off here. And it turns out as he's looking through all of the messages that are going out, that Mark Antony has been put up for election for People's Tribune. Now, I d didn't want to look into this because when you're covering a property that is, that is as popular as Rome is, a lot of times looking up something specific about like, how does People's Tribune work? you will wind up getting spoiled inadvertently. It'll be like, so it, this position was also depicted in the popular series Rome, where Mark Antony was thrown from a cliff. You know, like, there's... I have had that happen before. I'm not lying. So I don't know exactly what People's Tribune is meant to specifically, how it's meant to function. I feel like the implication is that he is the representative, the voice of the people. But I don't know functionally how that is meant to work. He's supposed to have a veto power that is crucial, <laughs> as it turns out, to Pompey's plan. And that does not go well. Um, but this dude, Posca, is incredulous at the fact that he has put Mark Antony in this position. And he says, I understood the tribunate to be a sacred office with the power of veto over the Senate, an office of great dignity and seriousness. And Caesar says, yeah, I mean, we're going to send Strabo so that we can make sure that Mark Antony behaves himself. And when we see it cuts directly from to make sure Mark Antony behaves himself to Mark Antony raping some poor, like, goat herd woman on the side of the road. It's really like, this, I feel, is actually sort of well done. My, it, my preference is not having to witness a rape at all, obviously. If one has to happen, I would like that to be off camera. But this actually was sort of uh, affecting because of the fact that this girl is not actually crying, being beaten. He's not being violent with her. He's not, I mean, rape itself is violence, but you know what I'm saying? He's not like hitting her or doing something to her to like sort of sadistically get off. He is, and she is behaving in such a way as to submit quickly and get it over with is kind of the vibe that I get. She's not crying. She's not protesting, but I don't think this is something she wanted. 
I just think that this is, you know, he saw her and just decided that he was going to have her and pulled over like he was using a bathroom, literally. Um, and there, it, like, it's still super brutal. And the fact that he's doing this in front of all these men and is it's just taken as a matter of course that they're all just going to wait for him. It's uh, showing a lot about how they all see women like this. She is for his use. That is completely not a problem. The, the him doing this is his right. And it, that is just how, how they see her. And they're all waiting and they're impatient to get back on the road, but it doesn't seem like anybody is actually having a problem with what he's doing. Nobody sees it as rape. They just see it as him doing what he is allowed to do. And that tells us a lot. And also the fact that, you know, he is willing to hold up the whole procession home is telling us a lot about who he is because he just saw this goat herd and was like, yep, I'm going to do her and just gets off his horse with no like provocation at all. You know, um, it's just, a, it's a, an upsetting scene in how unupsetting the whole thing is presented, you know, like that's really, that's what's so affecting about it is just the fact that it's treated again, like he just pulled over to use the bathroom. Um, so anyway, as they're sitting there waiting for him to finish, Titus starts talking about how this dude is, uh, and by this dude, I mean, um, oh my God, what's his name? Guys, help me. Lucius, right? How Lucius is really close to seeing a wife that he hasn't seen in over seven years and how he's probably really nervous. And he starts to make jokes about how, like, what if she's gotten really skinny what if she's started fucking other people? What if she's lost all of her teeth? And it's really clear that all of these are fears that have occurred to Lucius. And he is angry and tells him to shut the fuck up. But as we see when they finally do see one another again, he has reason to be worried about it. It is just a uh, a really... Hmm. Oh, the whole, the whole sh presentation... And and reveal of what's actually going on there is so well done. But before they actually get to see their wives, he gets sidelined because they first have to present Mark Antony um, to the people. And I guess to the Senate, it looks like he's standing on the steps of the Senate and he's getting uh, all of these like rose petals and everything thrown at him. And the senators are walking by trying to console themselves that he has the love of the people when they don't. They're trying to act like, oh, well, he only has the love of the people because the people are idiots. And having that sort of love means nothing. That it's just like, it's just one of those moments of, of combination sour grapes, but also genuinely revealing what these men think of the people they're supposed to be representing and ruling for. And I have no doubt that this attitude is precisely the same today as it was then. I have absolutely no doubt of that whatsoever. And it's tough because like on the one hand, wanting to talk about the humanity at large as being mostly stupid is understandable. It's not untrue. However, having that kind of contempt and also serving are not things that you can hold in your head. And you have to have some flicker of belief in human goodness and generally like the idea of people wanting to do the right thing or trending towards doing the right thing. And these guys are just, they're past that, you know, they're at a point in their lives where they're basically doing what they can to get what they can for themselves. I feel like this is something that you have to fight against if you become a politician. I feel like you get into politics really believing that you're doing this because you want to do something positive. I feel like that's mostly how it goes. And then you start to get worn down. And if you don't guard against it, this is where you wind up. Um, 
So Mark Anthony tells Lucius, you may dismiss the men and you can dismiss yourself. Go out and uh, take the boy back to Atia and tell your lovely mother, I will see her later. And he means that in the biblical sea. Um, so Lucius takes this kid back to his mom. And I had really forgotten that Lucius isn't noble. Um, because I wasn't paying attention to the clothing is really the thing. Um, and he, like her son, whose name I'm forgetting offers, he's like, why don't we let him and Titus eat with us? And it's really clear that this is not done. And the fact that he is talking about it so blithely uh, it bothers Atia a little bit and she's trying to be cool because she, I think she can sense that her son has some real potential and she wants to stay on her son's good side. And she's also interested in like, well, maybe I can make something out of this. Who knows where this is going to go? She's very opportunistic. And I feel like she just keeps an open mind as long as there's the possibility of gaining something from it. She's not, I don't want to say she's not a snob because she's definitely a snob. Of course she has to be, but like, she's just so much more, because she's willing to do anything, she doesn't have any scruples in that regard, I don't feel. It makes her a lot more farsighted. And so she is willing to go with things that are less traditional in the moment just to see, well, I never considered this option, but all right, I maybe can get something out of it. Let's try it. Um, and her reaction here, I meant to say something about this, but I completely forgot. She um walks in on her daughter who is with her husband um, and she is horrified that this dude is still part of her daughter's life and like calls the guards and wants them to get the dogs. And her daughter is yelling at her that I hate you. I hate you. And she shoves her and Atia turns around and smacks her across the face and her daughter runs off, collapsing in bed, crying. But you know what? I don't blame her. It's easy to look at this girl and be like, oh, get over it. But seriously, her mother is the worst. And she has already like been married to the guy that she wants to be with. And I'm sure she thought that meant it was a done deal and did not expect to be treated this way. Octavian. Thank you, Sean. Is that that's her son? Um, So... <laughs> Yeah, her, and she walks into the other room, Atia, and she's like talking to her maid and says something like, I'm just trying to do what's best for her. Can't she see that? And it's just one of those like really amazing little character moments because I think Atia really thinks that she's doing what like that she's trying to do what's best for her daughter because she has so little understanding of what best means. And also that she's just doesn't have the self-awareness to realize you're not doing what's best for your daughter. You're doing what's best for yourself. And by best, again, in quotation marks, it just means politically advantageous. She doesn't consider her daughter's emotional state or her desires as a person or her, you know, goals in life. She is only thinking about advancing her family and she thinks that's all her daughter should also be concerned with. And if she were, she would see that this is the path to take. And I think she really believes that in her way. Um, but obviously her daughter is not built out of the same stuff she is. And it's easy to think that's a good thing in some ways, because you want, decent people with hearts around and her daughter putting her on blast later making fun of the way that she like makes so much noise during sex cracked me up I could not lie but I have to say that Atia is so because she's got such a long view of things is much more likely to survive in one piece than her daughter is like her daughter being the age she is and being as pretty as she is, is a total pawn. And 
unless she starts to smarten up and really see the way that people like her mother can use her, that's all that's going to happen is she's going to get used all her life. And she needs to start looking at how she can use herself. And I don't know if that's going to happen because it's so tempting when you come across this sort of question, like, do you want somebody to get smart about how about the kind of like opportunities that they can, or do you want them to stay good and innocent in their way? And it's like, I would love for her to be able to stay innocent for the sake of it, but I don't think that's good for her in the long run. So as much as it hurts to like watch somebody wise up, you sort of want that, you know? Um, so Lucius um, comes in and has Octavia, um, what is it? Octavian with him. And she immediately is like, was it very horrible? And he starts to open his mouth and she says, of course it was. I can't even imagine. We shan't talk about it. We should just put it totally out of our minds. And again, what a moment because she knows that he probably went through some shit and Frames it like, oh, for, for your sake, we'll just forget it. No, the truth is she does not want to hear about it because she doesn't fucking care. And she frames it just like so. She's very smart. She's very smart. Um, and she says, but who are those? You're to be very good to the mother. They're particular friends of mine. Friends in what particular? And she says this in a way that I'm like, mm, does she think they were fucking her, his, her son? Um, these are the men that took me from captivity. And again, I'm looking at them and I should see that from the way they're dressed, they're basically in outfits akin to Dobby the house elf. You know, it looks like they're wearing old battered white pillowcases that are now gray with a belt and a sword. And that's pretty much it. Um, and I still forgot until the way she reacts here that they are socially so far below her that this is a, just a really awkward moment. Um, and I am very curious if she is like able to do anything with them. She says, we embrace you good, fearsome specimens that you are. And I love because look, these two dudes standing here, I'm not going to lie. They look good. You know, like Titus is like fucking humongous. There are a couple fight scenes later that I cannot believe how fast he is considering how large he is. Like I, I can't help but think they must have sped the camera up for a couple of these moments because he is just so fast that combined with being like six, five or whatever he is, it just seems unfair that you could be fast and huge like that. It doesn't seem like that's allowed. It should not be allowed. And, and Lucius is like, <laughs> they really cast well because Lucius does have this sort of humorless, wholesome face that it, he's, it's not that he's not handsome, but he's just so serious that it, you're you're kind of like, all right, no, I can I can kind of dig it, but also like you really need to loosen up, guy. And I could see her being like, mm, I wouldn't mind a visit from you too, even though it's like you're definitely lower class. I mean, I'm willing to dabble a little bit. Um, and she says you must be rewarded before you go, and she's about to pay them, and they insist that it's not necessary. And her son says. Oh, they'll stay and eat. And when she says out in the kitchen, he interrupts and is like, no, no, with us. And her face sort of falls for a second. Um, and, you know, of course, Lucius is like, I appreciate it, but I have to go to my wife. And here we get like Octavian is a really interesting character to me already because he is shitty but he also has the right idea about some things. So he's like over here being generous in treating them like equals. But then the instant that Lucius puts up any sort of 
protest and is like, well, I want to go back to my wife. He's like, your wife has been waiting for eight years. She can wait a little longer and completely steamrolls over what this guy wants and treats him as not an equal at all. And I'm super curious to see how this role like continues because that's the thing you can think that you see people as equals but when you are raised in a society like this that is literally impossible you can think you see people as equals in principle but in practice this is the shit that happens and this is the sort of thing that i really wish i could get across to folks who don't understand white privilege white supremacy and ingrained prejudice because the the attitude of like, oh, I don't see color. We're all human is a beautiful theory, but you don't behave like that. You don't practice that, you know, and that's the thing that's going on with Octavian is like he talks about wanting to like represent and respect the lower classes and, you know, actually there there's just like a desire in him to be fair but he does not really understand what being fair actually means. Um, so, yeah, he says they ride with the standard. It's standard. It's perfectly acceptable to eat to them. And she says it's symbolic. We shall dine together as equals and agrees to this. And it becomes this like whole weird political scene in which they all get into arguments. I just... I really enjoy the the escalation of that conversation because especially today, I feel like a lot of us have wound up in this position where we're like hanging out with people that we don't know very well, that we don't necessarily like, and we know we should just fucking sit on our opinion and shut our mouth so that this can go smoothly and we can just get it over with. But they say things that are just so outlandish, incorrect, and or offensive that we can't in good conscience just sit there and not say anything. And it turns into this whole, like, you know. Um, but we'll get to that later. We see Mark Antony in his, uh, like, in the midst of the ceremony to make him, um, what do they call it again? The people's something. Um tribune right 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 and it's really fun because you can see on his face how like completely uninterested he is he's just so bored and he really like later on it's clear that he doesn't know why he's been put here i don't think that caesar because what what it turns out to be is that caesar chose him specifically because he knew that this guy was going to rile everybody up and he wanted them riled up because he needed to force uh, Pompey's hand. He needed to create a situation in which Pompey, like, a, like, openly decided to move against him. And in doing so, Pompey would give Caesar the perfect standard to summon his men to his his cause in riding against Rome because otherwise he was meant to be riding against Rome as a traitor but if Pompey turns his back on him and decides that he's going to like act out publicly he can ride on Rome as i uh, as like the displaced righteous pre preferred ruler he can ride on Rome and be like this guy said he had my back. We were supposed to be friends. Look at everything I've done, the lands that I've conquered, everything I've given you people. And this guy is trying to get me out of here. Do you really want that after everything? And it just is so sad how incapable Pompey is. Like he really does not understand what how subtle Caesar is and how much he understands human nature. That's really the thing. And it's a similar thing, like with every person who is in this kind of power position, you have to not only understand how politics is meant to work. You have to understand how politics actually works. You have to understand the personalities of the people from whom you are demanding allegiance or action. And you have to understand how, 
how they behave and how that is likely to be interpreted by the people around them. So he knows that Mark Antony is not going to take this seriously. He knows that he is going to be aggressive and provoking and incendiary. He knows that he is probably not going to, uh, you know, be able to hold back from being mildly threatening and that this is going to like, he's just a hothead, right? He's a hothead. He's a child. And that this person being his sort of spokesman is exactly what he needs to force Pompey to move because Pompey doesn't have the wisdom to understand Caesar is manipulating you by purposefully sending somebody who's going to get under your skin. He's doing this. It's, you know, so I find this to be really fascinating to watch because of the fact that nobody involved in this except for Caesar and maybe Octavian, considering how intelligently he's been looking at everything, really seems to understand what's happening, the way that the strings are being pulled. Caesar is, is he knows people pretty well, man. And the only thing that I think could get him at a disadvantage is having some unknowns added to the equation. Because as long as he's working with people that he's familiar with, that he has relationships with, that he can pull favors or at least like predict their actions, as long as he's got that, he has the advantage. But if he should run into, you know, and again, I don't know how the politics work here too well. But if a couple of senators should be added to the mix with whom he is not too familiar and who seem too pure hearted or whatever, it might not be easy for him to manipulate them. And honestly, even the pure heartedness isn't necessarily anything because you can manipulate somebody who is good of heart almost more easily because you know precisely what they're going to do, which is the right thing. And that's a very easy thing to, if you have that kind of insight to manipulate and predict itself. So anyway, I'm just like totally here for this whole thing with, uh, with Mark Antony. Um, so yeah, uh, we have the, the scene with Luci Lucius and um, Octavian and Titus, and he's talking about, you know, all of the, uh, pre the sacrifices that he is going to make um, now that he is home. And it, I think it's meant to be as a penance for the men that he killed in battle. I believe like he has kept exact count. Um, and he's talking about the priests selling him the goats and things that he's going to kill and getting a discount. And, you know, it's just Polo says something about, I just deal directly with the God that I'm talking to. I, the priests are all crooks. And obviously in our modern opinion, probably that is exactly right. Like they are crooks that's the, the selling of animals and sacrificing them at the same location by the same group and religious organization is uh, like just look at it it's a pretty corrupt practice right like yeah you're telling people it, it's just and I just really like these little culture things that we get dropped in. And I don't think that I really talked about the, um, the slitting of the throat of the uh, oxen because Atia like bathes in the blood of this oxen in order to ensure her son's safety um, last episode. And it's a pretty intense scene, you know, it's like, a weird thing because there's all these people gathered around and they're all chanting. So the energy in the scene starts to get really hyped up and I'm just so fascinated. And I always have been with chanting and the way that energy gets built, the way that sound and music and repetitive sound, especially can like get into your blood 
you know, and make you feel something. And, I, you know, like the haka is one of the prime examples of that. If you can watch a haka and not be ready to, like, sprint for a mile straight after watching it, I don't know what to say to you. Because those things get me fucking hyped up. And it's very similar with a lot of hip hop that I listen to and things like, like there are just some songs that you just like really like get into this place. And um, the sacrificing of the oxen and her like bathing in it is just it's fucking that's a lot. It's a lot. You know, it's fucking living blood pouring all over her. Woo. Um, and she says something to Lucius about how she commends him. Because too few Romans do things the correct and traditional way anymore. Um, so, you know, she says something because I think uh, it's Octavian who says that he is a Catonian. And he says, well, I mean, he represents the tradition and I do subscribe to that. And she says, well... That's he also represents the nobility. Surely a plebeian like yourself would like to see some change made. And he sits there sort of like unsure and just kind of says, I think it should remain as it was at the founding. Why should that change? And Octavian says, because the Roman people are suffering, because slaves have taken all the work, because nobles have taken all the land and the streets are full of the homeless and the starving. So again, he gets it in some ways, but he doesn't really. And I'm not sure if he ever will. Um, so anyway, I've got to speed this along because I am just focused too much on the beginning of this, but I'm just fascinated by a lot of it. We get Lucius going home to his wife and she is holding a baby and he flips out. I don't know. Do you guys hear that? There's like this clicking sound. I don't know what that is, but it's really starting to creep me out. Um, but she has this look on her face. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Sean's commenting. I was raised Catholic, not so much anymore. And I was wondering how outsiders see those rituals probably as oddly as we see this. Honestly, Catholicism is super duper pagan. So like, I see it in a very similar way. Catholicism, you know, you're meant to be drinking the blood of and eating the body of a deity. It's not far off at all. I mean, I don't really think that I can't help but wonder if there was a time where you were literally drinking the blood of a sacrificed animal and not wine, which it very tidily is today. Um, it's just the, the whole, a lot of religions just, there are not that many dissimilarities. It's just cloaked differently or presented in a different context. So, yeah, I mean, and the whole thing here, like, it's not even that I find it odd because honestly, religions with these sorts of rituals have existed for far longer than they haven't. So it's not even the oddness. It's just how intense it is, you know, like, literally being underneath a platform of an animal whose life's blood is pouring out of it onto your face. Like that is just, that is a lot. It seems it like in, if you told me in principle, this is what they did. I'd be like, okay, that makes sense. But watching it happen, I'm just like, wow. Okay. Good Lord. Um, so he gets home Lucius and he sees his wife holding a baby and calls her a whore. And it's really like the fulfillment of every fear that he has had, I think, while he's been gone. And she has this expression on her face that to me looked guilty as fuck. It felt like 100% that is her baby. Then she says it's his daughter's and that she had sex with a crofter. I couldn't help but think immediately that she was full of shit. But then when she runs inside and hands the baby to her daughter and her daughter doesn't protest, 
I thought, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe this is her daughter's baby because her daughter seems to just go with this whole deception without so much as her having to tell her what the deception is, you know. But I think all she had to say was your father's back and her daughter understood because they all assumed he was dead. That it, she she says later, the pay stopped coming from the army and they assured her they never make mistakes and that he had to be dead. So this woman has been operating under the assumption that her husband has died, has clearly taken up with somebody else and had their child. I don't know where that person is or who they are, but she, all she has to say to her daughter, who is fully aware of everything that's been going on and that her mother has a child by somebody else, all she has to say is your father's home and shove the baby in her arms. And her daughter's probably smart enough to figure out what the fuck she's supposed to say and do. And this leads to this whole like song and dance and deception of the daughter saying that she's like into the uh the I forget what he's called. It's not a crofter, but it's sort of similar to a crofter, I think. Um but she's like, you know, in in love with him and he they're the ones who had sex and he has to come to the father and like ask for permission to marry the daughter and the father is like, "Did you not think that you should this she is my property. Did you not think that you should come to me?" And ask permission before sleeping with her. And I'm like, well, first of all, the fact that you can just say she's my property and everybody's like, well, yeah. I'm just like, ew. Second of all, where was he going to go to ask permission, dude? What do you, did you, did you think he was going to go to Gaul? No. What are you thinking? But of course, he has to be this kind of like irate because he's meant to be defending his daughter's honor. And finally, the dude assures him that, like, we make pretty good money, actually, doing what we do. And we have a house and everything. And he finally agrees that, yes, she can marry you. Um, And it's a tough thing because, as we know now, once his wife starts feeding the baby, that's her kid. But they're all pretending it's her daughter's. So she has to hand her own child over to live in a different house. And that's going to be really tough, you know. Um, But she herself, and forgive me, I don't remember his wife's name. So if you're here, Sean, help me out. Um, But she is obviously really fucked up over the fact that he is home when she thought he was dead and the fact that he is treating her like a complete stranger. And we heard the way that he talked about her to Titus. Like he definitely has real affection and respect for her. He definitely thinks of her as being special and is it seems like lucky to have her and he seems to recognize that he is lucky and he was lucky to be given the dispensation to marry at all as well. Um, Niobe. Thank you, Sean. But he doesn't act as if he is at all happy to see her. It seems to me he is deeply ashamed of having called her a whore in front of everybody, but he still has some misgivings for some reason. It feels like there's a piece of him that is suspicious. And all of this with his daughter and the baby feels like it's been explained away. But I think he still has the sense there's something else going on. And that's a tough thing to really put into words when there's no evidence for it. But she is resentful of the distance between the two of them and the fact that you know, he came home and didn't offer any loving word or sign of affection or anything to her. And she says so to Titus later. And Titus tries to assure her that your husband was never took a woman while he was away and that he always talked about her and loved her. Like he he was just nothing but reverential. Now we know that Lucius has been very reserved. I don't know that I'm willing to believe he hasn't fucked any woman for eight years. And Niobe isn't really willing to believe that either. But I like the fact that despite 
Lucius being a dick to Titus, which don't get me wrong, has been deserved. I like that Titus is still willing to take his side, not even take his side, but just speak for him, you know, just like give him, put in a good word. And it's just kind of a, a precious little moment. Um, and as for Titus, you know, he and Lucius, after leaving this thing, Lucius heads home and sees his wife for the first time. Titus goes to a brothel. Um, this brothel, by the way, yikes, am I wrong? Like, it's basically like a barn with women in it instead of horses. You know, it's like everything is like open. There's just it's really basic. Um, but he then decides that he's going to go gambling and when he says that he's with the 13th, the men in this room all sort of seem to tense up because he's like, you know, with Caesar and they are all Pompey's guys, allegedly. Um, so he's rolling dice and he seems to get uh, like the vibe that these guys are fucking with him, that there's something going on. And this dude starts to get really sort of aggressive with him about it and says something like, so how do you feel soldier? You feel good. And he takes his hand and stops him as the guy reaches out to take the dice. Now help me out here because it seems like Titus caught this dude cheating but the guy like reaches out to, to pull the dice and the coins towards him. Titus stares at him and flips his hand over and there are two other dice in his hand. What exactly was this dude doing with the other? Like, I, I don't know enough to understand this. Are, are the dice that they gave to him weighted? Like they're two different sets. Basically, there's the ones that roll well and the ro ones that roll badly. And they gave him the bad ones is what I'm assuming. But why did he even have them in his hand? Oh, because he was going to switch them out. Right, 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 right. Okay, I think I get it. Um, so, yeah, he sees those those other dice and s sort of laughs and stares at the dude. And you can see everybody is completely unsurprised. That's really the main thing to me is that it's not just that the guy is cheating, but that literally everybody in that room knows he's cheating and they don't give a fuck because Titus is part of the 13th and fuck this guy. So this is one of the parts where it's so fast that I'm just like, holy shit, because Titus stabs this dude through the throat before you can even take a breath. It is so sudden and so clinically perfectly executed and not pun intended and just the precision of it is it's stunning and it turns into this huge fight in which somebody winds up bashing Titus over the back of the head with a like bottle or something and broken shards of it get like embedded into his head and he winds up stopping dead and there is a moment of just like him staring blankly and he staggers against this wall and winds up dragging himself all the way to Lucius's. And I don't think I really understood the kind of damage he had just sustained because I was like, what is he doing going to Lucius's? But he knows that he has exactly one person who is going to be a, like, who's going to have the money to get a doctor in here, a proper doctor and he knows, I think, that there is something that he cannot handle that is in his head. I think he felt something like pierce his brain. Now, the brain is a bananas thing. I'm not going to talk about it because I don't have time. But the brain can't like sense injury. Did you guys know this? So you can feel like the injury to your skin on your head. You can feel, but like the brain itself doesn't feel anything, which I just find so fucked up. That's so weird. Um, but yeah, there follows this like horrifying surgery scene where they are, you know, figuring out exactly how to 
get these pieces out of his head and patch everything back up again. And it winds up working, which is shocking. Um, the money that the doctor wants is astronomical, but he also seemed to have some measure of skill. And he also says something to uh, Lucius about how like, oh, yeah, and often sacrificing a white rabbit works. And I really love the way he says it, because it's just like he's prescribing a medication. He's just like, you know what, let me write this down for you, too. We'll ask him to fill out a week worth of this rabbits. Like, I just I love this attitude. It's so revealing. Um there is a brief scene where there is somebody who is putting a notch, like they they have a ladder. It's up against this huge, um, what looks to be almost like a notice board of some kind. And they climb up the ladder to this like symbol and they insert a gold fish symbol. And I don't know what that all was. If anybody knows, I don't, I have no idea. Um, but the the whole thing with Titus is just really, guys, oof, Lord of mercy. But yeah, this he's staying with them while he recovers. They're not even sure if he's ever going to like wake up, but he winds up uh, being able to wake up enough to defend Lucius to Niobe, which is kind of great. Um, so then we go to what's his face, Lucius going down to examine the slaves that he is going to sell. And again, the show doesn't seem concerned. They're like, okay, yeah, this dude is definitely like slightly more upstanding in his way than some people are. He's unwilling to do this and that. However, he also owns and sells human beings he also calls the women in his life his property. He is not somebody that we're going to dress up in our present standard and pretend that he would have existed at this time because that he would not. And the dude who's like managing the slaves for him, first of all, is wearing the most insane wicker hat. I don't even know what to say about it. Um, but he tells him basically that these people are way too thin and look super, uh, what's the word? They're, they just look bedraggled. Like the eyes of everybody as he passes by them are really beaten down. These are people who have lost hope, you know? And this dude's like, yeah, we should hang on to them, feed them up, get them a little bit of air and exercise, get them looking a little bit healthier. And then we can sell them and make a lot more money than you're going to make from them right now. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty rough, honestly, you know, like I just feel for them. The fact that this is just a part of life. I don't really know. I, uh. all right. So I, f I feel like I've mostly covered the overall effect of what happens in the Senate, but I don't really understand the move that Pompey is trying to make here because what he wants is to pass a motion that will force um, Mark Antony to veto it which will then put them in a position to do another thing that he wants. And what winds up messing his plans up is that Mark Antony does like everybody gets so provoked over everything that the, a fight breaks out. And Mark Antony, despite yelling that he's vetoing, the veto is not recognized. And I find it really fascinating that the veto is, it, it it is not considered to count unless people heard it, even if the main person who is running this whole meeting sees that it's happening. The fact that it's not acknowledged by everyone is just uh, that makes it irrelevant, which I just, you know, that's crazy. Um, and 
Mark Antony stand, like, stands up and tries to veto it after being ordered to, basically, because the poor dude doesn't even know what he's supposed to do here. And they are trying to say at the end of this fight, because they literally break out into fist fights, which, guys, is this is not as uncommon a thing even today as you would think, which I think is amazing. I low key want a fist fight to break out on our Senate floor, but I know that it would not end well because probably somebody would have a gun. Um, but the whole thing goes so badly and they know that the, like later on the next day, I think it's Cicero, right? Is saying that like, we didn't actually close the meeting. So tomorrow we can start the same meeting from the middle and he has the opportunity again to veto and we can save this thing. And Antony himself is talking to his advisors and he is saying, you know, he says, formally, it is the same session. So you may yet exercise your veto on the motion. And Antony says, unless Pompey tries to stop me. True. He may very well try. Uh, because he doesn't understand Pompey wants him to do it. He thinks Pompey genuinely wants the first motion. He doesn't get that he's part of Pompey's plan to fit. So when he's like, well, Pom unless Pompey tries to stop me and it's just sort of like, mm -mm, no, we're not doing that. So he just gathers his men and decides to like, you know, go. It, it, the whole plan is that he wants an entire show of force. He wants all of them riding out with him as he heads to the Senate. Right. And the whole plan hinges on him getting there so that he can cast his, his veto. So of course, Pompey is adamant that you can threaten him, but do not harm him. And they're on their way heading there. And it looks like they're going to be able to make it without incident until T Titus Pulo spots one of the dudes who tried to rob slash kill him. And that dude lunges at him from the crowd. And it looks like he's trying to come at Mark Antony and Titus stops this dude grabs the knife, punches him in the face and slits his throat in seemingly one motion. It is breathtaking, to be honest. And of course, everyone assumes that this dude was trying to assault Mark Anthony, and it turns into the fucking bloodbath that it does, which gets Caesar exactly what he wants. And Pompey is standing there looking like a fucking moron, trying to yell at an angry mob. No violence, Pompey, dumb. <sighs> he just doesn't know what he's doing. That's all it is. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, Lord. Um, I, I love the fact that Cicero, like, yells at Mark Antony to veto the motion. And Mark Antony has no idea why, doesn't know what's happening, is looking around, like, dazed and puzzled. And a guy yells at him to do a thing, and he just jumps up and does it with no understanding of why or what advantage that gives to them, whether this is a good move or not. He just does what he's told because he just doesn't know any better. He's like a dog. You know, he's like a golden retriever. He's, like, really overeager and happy and just kind of, like, carefree about it all bless him <laughs> all right guys i have to wrap up i'm over time but thank you so much to sean for commissioning this this has been a really fun show so far i hope i get to do more of this soon um and i hope you guys are enjoying the coverage and i will be seeing you again soon hopefully fingers crossed with a new episode toodaloo motherfuckers Spoiled Network Podcast.